we're really going to have a really quite epic conversation today, uh, thinking about everything from uh, subsea cables to clouds right up to the stars and everything in between. And from we know from whether it was the Viasat hack at the start of Ukraine conference, whether it's subsea cables being cut in Svalbard or accidentally being cut by fishing boats in Somalia or earthquakes in Tonga, that they, we can talk a lot about the technical aspects of cyber, but we have to re remember the physical aspects of our infrastructure and how we're working to make those resilient. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, taking the extraordinary pleasure to ask some questions that I've always wanted to know from our fantastic uh, panelists here. So joining me uh, in no particular order, we have uh, Toella. And you're Joa, who's the Head of Economic Integration for the African Union Development Agency. Have Patricia Freimaker, the, the Director of Global Cybersecurity Policy at Microsoft. Um, over there, right at the end, we have uh, Giacomo Percy Pauli, the Head of Security and Tech Program at Unity, and an author, no less. And um, Manon Leblanc, uh, Coordinator for Cyber Issues at the European External Action Service. So I guess what I'd like to do just to kick off and sort of really quick fire is to ask each of you, what is the issue that's foremost in your mind right now when you think about that intersection between seas, cloud and stars? And uh, Tawella, can I start with you? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> uh, do you have a mic there? Is there? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, gosh, it's an interesting question. What's sitting in my mind at the moment? I think I'm always very concerned about um, the fact that I think for, for, for us on this side of the, of the, of the world, um, I think a lot of times things happen to us. You know, so whether it is as we talk about technology, as we talk about cybersecurity and so on and so forth, I think we're still at that point where we um, perhaps are more reactive than proactive, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of capacity, it's an issue perhaps of capabilities, um, and the question is then how do we transcend that? I think I'm, I'm optimistic in terms of the fact that we now have some kind of a, you know, an African agenda on cyber capacity building, which hopefully will help us to navigate some of the issues around the capacity, um, but I think we'll always um, have to think through how to navigate the technology aspects of it um, as well. Thank you. Okay, so things happen. <laughs> so how do we make sure we're in place where things happen? Uh, Giacomo, what's uh, top of your mind today when we think about these? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, and good afternoon, uh, all of you. I think for me, what is, what is really on my mind right now is that the world is, is sending us signals that all of these things are connected. So we cannot really uh, disentangle the relationship that exists between, between all of these different layers of technology and infrastructure. Nevertheless, while the world is sending us those signals, we as you know, the, the policymaking community is great at keeping all of those discussions siloed and isolated between each other. So what I'm really concerned about is the fact that this kind of uh, uh, interdependencies between different technologies and infrastructure, are, we're going to fail to really capture the significance of these interdependencies because no one is really looking at them together. We are masters of creating silos of excellence, but we're not really good at building bridges across these silos. So lots of horizontal expanding surfaces, but nothing sort of thinking about them all vertically through the middle. Manon, what's your take and what's worrying you right now? So I, I completely agree with Giacomo. I mean, these things are, are very much uh, related uh, to each other. And although indeed they all require their own attention and they have their own ecosystems and they have their own ways of cooperation and their own legislation, indeed the art now is to how to connect these efforts uh, to make sure that you have this holistic picture, but also to make sure that you cooperate with 
other partners in this regard that sometimes own this or have a, another uh, important role to play in uh, either the governance or uh, the development of, of uh, these types of technologies. And uh, for us, I think where things come together uh, is when you, for instance, do stress testing, when you do exercises, when you uh, uh, have a scenario-based discussion circling around incidents such as the via set or such as uh, recent cable uh, disruptions. Uh, and then from that point, actually try to understand what kind of mechanisms are triggered and how can we ensure that these are actually connected with each other. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'll just go I'll get mine. <laughs> to the private sector. And uh, what's uh, your viewpoint? Where is it sitting for you? What's, what's top of mind for me right now is we know that the nation state actors are evolving every day. They have more sophisticated, um, you know, tactics and techniques. And I think that's a cross-cutting issue across the technologies that we're discussing today. Um, you know, comms sector is a critical infrastructure sector, at least by definition in the U.S. While cloud is not critical infrastructure, that mindset is changing. And so we do know the nation state actors, one of their primary focuses are critical infrastructure. And so what's top of mind for me is the adversaries, they they don't have borders, right? Their cyber attacks transcend borders. And so how can we collaborate globally to understand the threat attack surface, the evolving threat landscape, and with collaboration and partnership, be able to um, you know, give our cyber defenders that advantage? Indeed, they are the most creative people on earth and we need creative policy to uh, match that. So um, think about that. I want to go back to Manon. We're going to start deep, deep, deep in the seas. Let's <laughs> start the, uh, there and think about, um, you know, we've mentioned that uh, cables up there, you know, susceptible to both physical and cyber threats. What are emerging for you as uh, you've highlighted the threats, but what are emerging as uh, the best practices for defending against these uh, critical underwater assets? And really, how does government and industry and, um, and the policy community, I guess, all work together to help defend them? Thank you. And indeed, I mean, we're going deep seas and, and although it seems far away, it's actually very central to everything that we do every day. Uh, the role of cables and the fact uh, that they uh, transmit all our, day, uh, all our data is not to be too underestimated. Certainly not as uh, a cable is disrupted. Uh, which is just your only cable, you know? I mean, it happened to Tonga last year, uh, and the impact it had on the country is uh, significant. So it's, it's really something that we, we luckily now are, are looking at with more attention. It has more attention also in the international debate, uh, and rightfully so, because threats, I mean, not only cyber attacks, but also sabotage, uh, but also disruption by just fishing or anchoring is really um, uh, harming uh, uh, connectivity of, of thousands uh, of people. There also international cooperation is essential because it's cross-border and because uh, it's not just uh, uh, this is my cable and I have nothing to do with anyone else uh, but just with myself. Uh, but what we see actually now is that uh, there is a bit of a patchwork uh, uh, in uh, the frameworks and the mechanisms that we have there. So how can we actually learn in these from practices of uh, particular states or practices that have been put out, for instance, by the International Cable Protection Committee uh, to see how we can create a bit of unity? Uh, and there, obviously, the law of the sea also plays a central role, the ratification of it, the implementation of it, uh, and the encouragement also for states uh, to take up some of the practices that are outlined there, as well as also uh, in, the, in the guidelines provided by, uh, by the ICPC. 
Uh, and those also mostly overlap with the practices that we, for instance, know within the Union. So within the European Union, uh, we have two uh, directives that actually are related to um, subsea cables. One is the Network Information Security Directive, which really focuses on cyber security, uh, and the other one is the uh, um, Resilience of Critical Entities uh, Directive, which is a sister, brother and sister, um, which really focuses on the uh, resilience of critical infrastructure. And there, for instance, having uh, a strategy in place, uh, doing uh, risk assessments, having incident response teams uh, at hand and also having the community at hand once an inc incident occurred. So are you in touch with the owners of, uh, of the infrastructure? Do you have uh, what it needs and procedures in order to uh, take forward uh, that work? Do you have a point of contact uh, uh, that is there? M maybe even have you in the first place established uh, 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 subsea cables as a critical infrastructure? Is that part of the debate that you're actually ongoing? So I think those uh, more basic, um, well, I mean, maybe from our perspective we would say basic, but I think there's um, a couple of things that one could do uh, uh, from the start, which also doesn't cost you any money, right? Designating critical infrastructures, uh, putting a, a single point of contact, uh, making sure you are, you have relations. Those things are uh, outside of your human resources for free. So I think that would already be a good basis uh, when we talk about the protection of subsea cables. So the key foundational steps that uh, rather than walking, well, walking before you can run, it's to get into this position. Yes. Um, well, with that, uh, Twella, I want to come for your perspective. I mean, as we load more and more onto these subsea cables with 5G, when we're looking at massive compute resources that can be on them, they're going to become even more critical to low- and middle-income countries. Um, what policies and investments do you believe, um, sort of where development assistance and capacity building are concerned, are needed to really make this shift and sort of its implications for cybersecurity? Okay. So I think, I mean, first of all, if you look at the continent, um, we have more coastal countries than we do um, countries that are inland. So of course, we know that there's quite a number of countries that either have um, submarine cable landing stations or have the potential or the desire to have them. So obviously, the issue of how we treat submarine infrastructure then becomes more important. And I think perhaps one thing that maybe the continent needs to think a bit differently about is that this should not only be an issue for the coastal countries, it should be an issue also for the countries inland, because whatever disruptions happen in terms of the infrastructure, um, you know, the submarine infrastructure at the coast has implications for the entire um, continent. I think what we sh uh, are seeing is that as countries are developing their cybersecurity strategies, they are beginning to recognize, as Manon has said, the fact that the submarine infrastructure needs to be um, categorized or designated as critical infrastructure. But I think what is also then needed um, to accompany that um, then is the, the relevant um, incidence response mechanisms, um, and these have to be collaborative, and it has to again be not only about the coastal countries, but about um, the countries that are also benefiting from that infrastructure. Um, I think capacity issues will continue to be a challenge. Um, what we've noticed or what we've seen is that when cable disruptions do happen, it does take a long time for, those, for, for the repairs to happen. Um, and, and part of what I've heard is that um, actually I think we only have, um, if I remember correctly, there is only one service provider that actually does all the cable, uh, that manages all the um, cable infrastructure, um, you know, east to, to west, uh, which means that when a break does happen, it takes maybe three months um, to repair done effectively. So it means that there needs to be a bit more investment in terms of um, the, the ability to recover, um, but it also then means that we also have to think about um, some of the measures to protect the infrastructure, whether it's physical measures or measures in terms of um, the relevant protocols that would actually protect um, the, the, the transmission of data on the, on the infrastructure as well. So it's really thinking about what your backup option is. And this has become increasingly critical as we begin to put our head in the clouds and think about, uh, sorry, I couldn't resist, <laughs> the, uh, what, the increasing threats to cloud infrastructure. So, Patricia, 
as we increasingly rely on our cloud services for essential services like e-government, education, sort of e-health, how can all these governments ensure that in un uninterrupted availability and security, particularly in times like crisis, so it sort of became critical in Ukraine, and what, from your view, is the role of industry and the other stakeholders, industries provide a backup but that, you know, how long can that take and what support does it need from other stakeholders as well? Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to approach um, that question by discussing three things. One, the, one, the critical role of foundational cybersecurity uh, practices, um, cloud's resiliency by design, and cloud's reliance on critical infrastructure. Um, so we know right now the stats are showing that 99% of successful cyber attacks could be thwarted if some basic cybersecurity hygiene uh, practices are implemented like you know, patching, threat detection, anti-malware, uh, zero trust, uh, data security, and MFA. Um, we also know that like for example, NGOs, about 15% of NGOs actually have cybersecurity personnel as staff and are implementing these types of uh, sec foundational security practices. And so I bring this up to say that with the hyperscale cloud, it makes it easier to implement some of these foundational practices or to abstract the need for the practices. So for example, with our SaaS solutions, um, it's easier to implement patching, like well, it, the, the cloud service provider takes responsibility for patching, and also security capabilities are built in. We, Microsoft sees about 62 trillion signals a day, and so that kind of uh, visibility is added on to our services in terms of evolving uh, uh, threat, um, threat information. Now, cloud's resiliency by design, um, at the core of the way we design, or Microsoft designs, um, you know, cloud services, redundancy and resiliency is built in. And so I'm going to start by discussing just a little bit about data center resiliency, just to level set there. This can be a several hours conversation to actually go through the whole process, but just want to touch a few key points there. Um, the, the cloud service provider's responsibility is building these things, right, to be resilient by design and building in redundancy. One of the far first places that we start with with the supply chain risk management, right, building a data center is a complex process in terms of it deals with a lot of different suppliers, vendors, and so using uh, best practices for supply chain risk management to avoid tampering um, or altering of components that are being put into the uh, data center. Um, Microsoft also uses a defense in depth process in safeguarding its data centers and doing annual risk assessments that factor in different internal, external, and environmental type uh, threats and factors. And just to give you some examples of what that means as an outcome is, for example, power. It takes quite a bit of power, right, to power a data center and keep it at a specific temperature. And so having 24-7 uninterruptible power supply, um, having emergency support power supply through an on-site generator, for example. And then speaking about communications, right, um, you have to ensure that the data center has connectivity. And so uh, Microsoft builds in redundancy by having at least two to four fiber network pathways. So in case there's a fiber cut, the traffic is instantaneously routed to another network traffic. And then just to quickly touch on data and network resiliency, right? Global dispersion um, of is, is core to redundancy. And you, you brought up Ukraine as an example, right? We know that the ability of Ukraine to be able to disperse its assets and, and systems into cloud and another nation was, was very key. And that would lead me to one of my, my final recommendations around being able to, to have uh, that capability to do so. And so what I want to leave, you asked the question around what the responsibilities are for the stakeholders is that 
you know, while cloud service providers commit to building, you know, their data centers, infrastructure, network architecture to be resilient by design, it is a shared responsibility with a customer to have the resiliency in place. And so what do I mean by this? You as a government or an organization know your business best, right? You know what your business resilience thresholds are. You know what kinds of data you have, where the data is, what are your crown jewels. So these types of requirements and conversation is what informs what resiliency means to you. And I realize we never defined resiliency, and so by resiliency I mean an organization's ability to recover quickly in the event of some kind of disruption, but still be able to accelerate growth, right? That things don't ground to a standstill. And so having that conversation and, and remembering that technology is a business enabler. What are your business requirements? What are your security objectives? And just asking questions like, how much downtime can I tolerate? That actually informs where your data is replicated and what kinds of redundancy. And then my last point that I want to make about cloud's reliance on critical infrastructure. I, I think that traditionally this is an area that governments have not really played in, and so um, I, I would recommend that this is an area that's explored. Like I mentioned, it takes quite a bit of power and water um, to keep a data center running, and so Governments could play in this space by helping to ensure that there is the transmission capacity to do so. And I'll give you a very brief example. There's a region in Virginia right now in the US where no one can build any data centers because the electricity transmission capacity just does not exist. So this is a potential area that governments could play in. And the other recommendation, again, going back to Ukraine, um, just making sure that you have policies that can allow, you know, a country to quickly disperse its data and assets, you know, to uh, a region in another, another country. And so being able to allow the uh, uh, free flow of cross-border data flows. And um, I will stop there. Perfect. Thank you uh, so much. And, and yeah, the, I, the definition of resilient, I mean, my personal favorite is David Coe from Singapore, who says it's resilience is like being an escalator instead of an elevator, that you can walk up the stairs if everything comes to a standstill and you're not stuck in an elevator. Um, but So going up in an elevator all the way up to the skies to what is only the beginning now at the final frontier, I think. Uh, let's, uh, Giacomo, think about... Um, the development of LEOs, of uh, low Earth orbit satellites, is growing exponentially. Uh, what policies do you think need to be put in place to ensure the security and resilience of the systems, and particularly as they're becoming as uh, either reliance as the sole point of access in some cases, or as the backup points of access uh, for our communication system? Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm actually going to start by saying that I'm totally going to reuse that resiliency definition of uh, escalators and elevators. Uh, and I also want to double down on, on something that Patricia just said about the importance of being prepared also from a policy and regulatory perspective. You cannot wait until there is an emergency and you need to transfer data or transfer information and before you realize that you actually are not allowed because your national laws or regulations prohibit you to do that. So <clears throat> sometimes when we think about preparedness, we tend to focus more on the technical side, which is important, but we should not underestimate the importance of regulatory preparedness as well. That aside, uh, coming to your question, I think that if we could do a time lapse that allowed us to monitor how the number and type of actors that have space-based assets has evolved in the last 70 years, we will see not only the increasing number, but also how the different mix between uh, state and commercial users are now uh, you know, owning and managing space-based assets. So not only that, but are also offering space-based service, services as, as a service. So you know, uh, until a few years ago, certain uh, uh, services that were enabled by space-based assets could only be accessed by those that owned and managed those space-based assets. Now you can purchase them, whether it's imagery, communication, navigation, those things are, become, there is a market for those things. So all that to say that 
I cannot exclude a priori that we may need new policies and new, new regulations. However, I think that before we go there, because there is always the risk that by focusing on the things that we don't have, we distract ourselves from the obligations that we've already committed to. And we put too much emphasis on what new things needs to be developed to kind of distract perhaps the audience, perhaps uh, other states from the obligations that we've already made. So, and, th and that's why I'm saying that before we think about new regulations, it is important to realize that our space is already, there's already a robust legal and normative framework that uh, somewhat shapes behavior uh, in, in our space. There is an outer space treaty uh, that was signed in you know, 1967, so it's almost 70 years, but it's there, it exists. And the Outer Space Treaty already prohibits the use of force and the threat of use of force against space systems, and also establishes mechanisms to avoid harmful interference of space services. In addition, if that wasn't enough, there is also a, a registration convention that was established about 10 years after that really establishes obligations to register space objects, both at the national and international level. So if states were or, already uh, implementing uh, and, and following through the commitments they already have, our ability to verify and monitor behavior in, in our space would increasingly, we would, incre would increase significantly, which I think it's, it's important. Um, the international community more recently has been you know, uh, very active in discussing space security concerns in a variety of fora. Uh, even in the UN, there was a, an open-ended working group that just uh, um, concluded and more, more is to come. So there is definitely an appetite to discuss what more can be done. But I think it's important, again, that we, we don't focus on the new because we don't want to talk about the old, because that is, that is a significant risk. Um, and just the last point I wanted to make is that non-governmental entities as also you know, civil society and other uh, actors have been playing a, a critical role in supporting uh, uh, monitoring, verification, and accountability for behavior of states in, in our space. And you know, it's, it's, the role that they play, it's important to kind of manage threats and perceptions. So I think it's also important to keep them in mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, as a person with a secret legal past, um, I would say that it's always easier to strengthen what we have than to try and rewrite it all over again. Um, so we're going to go to another like quick fire and having sort of thought about international collaboration a little bit, uh, Giacomo, uh, I'd like to go to uh, Torella first and think about how can international collaboration across the development and international security community really be enhanced to protect against the common cyber threats to all these three sort of, um, we'll go to you first and then come to everyone sort of, what do you think is miss the missing ingredient at the moment? Um, so I think maybe if we look at the, the, the landscape um, that we're dealing with, I mean, obviously the cyber threats are, to some degree, I think there's certain common elements, whether you're talking about cloud, or you're talking about the submarine infrastructure, um, space, etc. Um, and at the same time, I think that um, some of the responses, as has been mentioned, is the policy responses, some of it is the capacity, you know, the capacity um, issues. Um, but I think what perhaps um, is needed when we start talking about the international um, collaboration and cooperation is that um, on the one hand, I think there needs to be a way in which um, the development partners perhaps are able to, to tailor this, the, the interventions to the specific context and needs of the countries. Um, at the same time, I think what um, perhaps um, needs to happen also is that uh, there needs to not be this patchwork approach where different partners are approaching the same country with different interventions. Um, and maybe there needs to be a way of seeing how do partners actually work together with the countries um, as opposed to you know one country having to deal with 10 partners on the same issue and each partner has only a very specific interest that maybe does not holistically look um, at what the, the, the deficiencies and the challenges and what the actual interventions um, are needed um, in the countries. Um, on the other hand, um, I think what we also find um, perhaps that um, our member states maybe need to, to deal with and think about a little more 
um, is, you know, when, when uh, Manon talked about the fact that the EU has directives, and when the EU issues directives, countries have to comply with those directives. Um, in the context of the African Union at the moment, I think a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of um, the, the, the uh, decisions, declarations, are non-binding on countries. So even if we have some kind of a framework, the lack of um, that mechanism that binds countries to act in a certain way, I think, is very challenging. And when we talk about cybersecurity, I think it becomes even more of a problem because you, you really cannot, I think, afford to be in a situation where countries can opt in or opt out of certain measures. So the question is, how do we address that? How do we uh, make sure that we see the seriousness of, of cybersecurity, its impact on our communities, its impact on our ability to, um, to engage in meaningful and impactful trade with the rest of the world, and really uh, maybe rethink and revisit the way in which we are actually approaching um, cybersecurity on the continent. And Thank you. Um, I'm going to, just because I'm aware of time ticking on and I do want to lead some type of audience questions, but I want to come uh, with quickly Patricia and think about, you know, we talk about, Tawala just talked about sort of lack of frameworks or things being opt-in and opt-out. Sort of one of the other alternatives are risk models and thinking about sort of what uh, is that, that approach has to offer. So are there any specific risk models or standards that you think that the government should adopt for this kind of harmonization? Thank you for that question. Um, you know what, Tuelo, you were giving your, your um, remarks there. I, something just occurred to me. I actually have been a coach for students that are participating in something called the Night 12 Challenge. Oh, you too. Okay, great. So uh, Atlantic Council puts together this 912 challenge where they present some kind of cybersecurity um, incident to students that usually crosses borders and they have to come up with a response. And one of the eye openers for me coaching uh, the students um, early this year is that one, you know, in the US, the National Cyber Incident Response Plan was pretty outdated, but they have, they are now revising it. And then also that there wasn't a specific framework, like something that I could pick up and say, okay, this is the framework that the globe works with together in case of this kind of cyber incident that involves different geographic areas. So I just wanted to just mention that, that in terms of a, a framework, I, I do think we do need to have some kind of framework that addresses crisis management. And then switching over to the question around um, standards, you know, a lot of these regulations, are, I mean, in cybersecurity today, there's regulations left, right, and, and center, there's regulations coming out of everywhere, right? And at the heart of these cybersecurity regulations, right, there are actual safeguards that the folks, either the governments or the organizations that are implementing these new rules and regulations, they have to put in certain safeguards. And how do you know what safeguards to implement? That's when you start to look to your technical standards, right? And so when policymakers are developing regulations, I, I think that it's very good for them. I recommend that they leverage cybersecurity standards that are one, international, two, that they're risk-based, and three, that they're consensus-based. And so just to give an example, the ISO, IEC, um, their working groups that develop a, a very wide variety of standards, and they have one, for example, for um, information system controls for cloud services, for example. And they have representatives of those working groups from different countries. So there's that multi-stakeholder approach, and not just a multi-stakeholder approach, it's a global multi-stakeholder approach, right? They're also consensus-based, which means that there's agreement and that it's been vetted. And last but not least, the risk base. I think we've kind of discussed a lot of things here and you can't protect everything at the same level and so you have to approach things with a risk-based approach. And so I, I do think that policymakers can leverage these types of international risk-based cybersecurity standards, which a lot of times also include the physical aspects as well of security. Um, the other example that I would, I would bring up is the NIST cybersecurity framework. And I know that sometimes there's a perception that it is an American best practice, it's not international, but it actually is international and this is risk-based. And what I think it's done very well, it's, it has provided a common language 
for us to discuss cybersecurity. I think that's so important when we're driving towards global coordination, global co collaboration, but how can we achieve those things if we're all speaking about cybersecurity in very different ways? And so leveraging these types of standards allow for not only having a common language or a common criterion or having that multi-stakeholder kind of approach, it also drives innovation, right? Because supply chain risk, uh, the supply chain is very complex. Again, it transcends borders. And so having a way to discuss technical requirements for cybersecurity risk management and cyber resilience uh, across borders drives innovation um, and allows that interoperability, right, between uh, different types of stakeholders. And so the last point I also want to make is the idea of leveraging these standards is not to just take them as is and not do anything else with them. You know, policy makers can actually build on these standards to, for example, address sectoral concerns. So I'll give an example, through public-private partnership um, in the US, the financial sector there, they took the NIST cybersecurity framework and they said, how would we approach cybersecurity risk management in the financial services context? And they created this kind of you know um, security framework for themselves based on this cybersecurity framework, and now what they've done is they've added a cloud piece to it and said for financial services institutions that are deploying workloads in the cloud, what does that look like, and how do you properly manage cybersecurity risk management? And so the flexibility that these standards offer policymakers to either address national concerns or critical infrastructure concerns, sectoral concerns, or even to specific technologies like cloud or like right now we have, we're discussing a lot of things around, you know, AI and IoT. And, and also the alignment to other controls that could be regional or specific kind of threats. So I know, for example, the NIST cybersecurity framework has been used to address, for example, ransomware. And so, um, yes, there are standards that could be leveraged. Let's not duplicate things that are already out there. But when the gaps are realized after doing this sort of kind of inventory sift, then we we develop new requirements that can close those gaps. Thank you. Okay, super quickly, Manon, because as I say, I'm sure there's people itching to ask everybody a question, but thinking about standards, and we've had the sort of Brussels effect alluded to a little bit, um, what would though be your recommendation for those countries with more limited resources that are trying to strengthen the resilience of subsea cables or which are vital for connectivity. Sort of from the view, from your view, sort of, you know, the low cost, high impact kind of uh, position there? Well, I think we, you know, this is typically uh, a, a topic and it's typically an area where we really need to work together. So indeed, there are things that uh, countries can do which have, for instance, a low redundancy or which do not have the uh, legislation in, in place, which have also location-wise maybe are in a difficult spot. Uh, so as said before, I mean, there are indeed recommendation and, and baseline things that you can do uh, around critical infrastructure designation, around... Uh, uh, creating your network around establishing a point of contact. But I think, moreover, uh, it's also to the international community state and to see how can we advance uh, the overall overall global framework to then support uh, such states in, uh, in advance in the resilience of their critical infrastructure and in particular then that cable around. I mean, that starts with something that also Patricia said before, uh, the responsibility that if you put down a cable that you already look at security by design, you know, like that you start with making it uh, as resilient as possible, uh, as secure as possible, uh, and also, for instance, the investments that we do in cables uh, as EU through the Global Gateway, that is really some, a criteria for that to be uh, put in place. Uh, at the same time, when you see uh, the recommendations coming out of the ICPC, the uh, Cable Committee, uh, but also if you see the recommendations uh, or the um, uh, legislative requirements, both when it comes to the law of the sea or when it comes to uh, the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, which address uh, the protection of critical infrastructure as well, uh, the, they all bear responsibilities for everyone to 
uh, to make sure that that infrastructure, which is a, a global good, is protected and is, is resilient. Um, of course, there we need to work together with all the partners. We have, need to have a good understanding of what is the need uh, of uh, countries which are, are less... Um, uh, less advanced in this uh, field. Uh, so I think this is really a joint effort and we, you know, of course, everyone has to play his part and the part of countries which are less advanced really start with uh, some of these baseline activities that I also referred to in my first in intervention. Uh, I think in the end, uh, and it's something that I wanted to pick up on, on what uh, Giacomo said and also like what is missing, I think we have already quite a lot. We need to make sure that we apply it and we need to make sure that we adhere to it. Uh, and there, what is sometimes missing is the implementation. We're always running to the next legislation uh, because it doesn't work, so we need something new. Sometimes it doesn't work for political reasons, uh, but that's, uh, you know, that's a, a matter of uh, particular countries in place. But we need to ensure that what we agree with each other at the United Nations levels, that we implement it and that we build our frameworks around it and one example, for instance, from the United Nations First Committee uh, discussions on cyber is that we have agreed with each other, uh, international law applies, we have norms of responsible state behavior that also include uh, protection of critical infrastructure as well as also uh, 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 norms that will help us to engage and cooperate with each other. Yet there are some states who just do not abide by it and who just ignore it. Okay, how, much, how many new rules do we then need if rules are not helping uh, for us to uh, do, uh, do the work that we need to do to enhance resilience? So in the end, um, it is our joint responsibility uh, in that sense, both uh, developed as well as less developed countries to cooperate uh, when it comes to uh, these essential infrastructures which are essential to all of us. Thank you so much. And uh, not to forget Giacomo, um, I just want to say quickly, um, you touched on a wider group of stakeholders and I just wanted to get your thoughts on what about um, academia and civil society and where do they sit within this picture for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I promise I'll be very quick. Um, I think that academia and civil society play two critical roles in this. Um, one, I, I see them as, as knowledge brokers and knowledge providers, whether it's by generating new knowledge or by facilitating the transfer of knowledge between different countries, those that are more advanced and those that are still in the process of building up their capabilities, I think it's key. Um, providing or encouraging a common understanding of key concepts and definitions. I'm just gonna give you a very quick example. In, in my own language, in Italian, the word safety and security are one. But conceptually, they mean two very different things, right? So even trying to use academia and civil society to, to share knowledge and provide clarity of what do we actually mean, what do words mean, because words matter, and it is important that we keep that in mind. So that knowledge piece, I think it's important. Also knowledge intended as making sure that there is transparency of uh, around policies and strategies, you know, Unidir has developed both uh, an actual uh, lexicon that tries to address the first part of the problem, so the problem mm -hmm. around concepts and, and, uh, and definitions, but we also developed a, a, a space policy portal that tries to map which countries have which types of policies and strategies. So this type of role I think is really important. And the second one, equally important, I think they are the really the, the, the interface between states and commercial actors. We often hear states have national security as their priority, commercial actors have business interest as their priority, academia and civil society tends to have people as their priority, so they can have really uh, uh, play a fundamental role in trying to kind of bring together states and businesses which are increasingly important. Thank you so much. I'm going to open up to the audience, but I'm going to do something a little odd, and I'm going to ask a question of our audience. So we have uh, the very brilliant Abu Bakr Idrissa here, um, who's uh, part of Nigerian communication satellites. So, so I want to just ask you for your thoughts, having you know heard everything that we've talked about today. Um, so what's your impression, the view from the ground, um, as to what you've heard and what needs to be done uh, to secure the infrastructure? Thank you very much. You said my name is Idris Abubakar. I stand on the existing protocol. 
The topic speaks about securing and resilience. What are you securing? What do you want, what do you want to secure? And the level of resilience of what? Demand drives consciousness of what is to be achieved. If we are all aware that there's a hundred million dollars out there for someone that comes first, I think everybody will be first. So I'm not trying to say the money is the driver, but there has to be something. Then the threat we are talking about, what are the causes of those threats? And what are the consequences of those threats to build resilience around? You talk of satellite, Leo satellite or Geo satellite or Mio satellite, they are repeater stations. They transmit information from one data center to another, from one platform to another, from one infrastructure to another. So we need to look at infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and network applications and the softwares as the services. When you look at network and softwares running there, we have data centers. Microsoft is spending a lot of money building data centers globally. Um, we have other service providers in those aspects, building equipments. But the fiscal infrastructure also need to be secured. You made mention of Ukraine. There might be a natural disaster, earthquake somewhere. How much copies of those data centers do you have? So that you have active master and slave situation that seamlessly service can be transferred. We have submarine cables, yes. Before now, submarine cables is what links the 30% of the land we have on Earth. The remaining is water. International waters are there. Most of the damages that happen to submarine cables are from the transportation, maritime activities. Uh, to some extent, that part has been taken care of by the business owners, trying to map out the lines where um, um, maritime activities should give a setback, just like the right, way, right of way in the city centers. Uh, but coming to cyber aspect of it, cyber is borderless. Single point failure is always the hardest place to hit. Financial institutions are always the victim. But again, there's political aspect of it. Then there's form for trial. The, the, the test on the satellite system that was carried out last year by Thales Alenia Space in conjunction with the ESA, European Space Agency, uh, was a proactive assignment to be done in those areas to see the vulnerability. However, the satellite or the data centers are of two components. The services they are providing, then the infrastructure they are made of. In the case of satellite, you have the platform that support the activities of the payload, which the payload can be um, the RF equipment if it is for communications, or camera system for remote sensing and weather activities. Those platforms are difficult actually to be attacked in the cyber world. If it happens, then it must be from inside because it's always not on the network. It's not on cloud network. It's not connected. But the services running on them are open interface, which in the submarine world, you have the VSAT on ships and everywhere on the land in the desert. They are there in the forest. You have those equipment that are carrying IP equipment, IP content, which is the cyber wall. Now, if my system is open, your system is closed because the whole globe is networked by switches and routers, and I'm transacting business with you, you're not actually safe. 
That's why global assignment need to come in. Global networking need to come in. But that resilience, how much can you bounce back? How quickly can you recover from the disaster, from the attack? The analysis of those attacks, the prevention of those attacks, how quickly can you do it? No one does it alone because we don't have the same time zone. If attacks come from Ghana against infrastructure in the US, you can disrupt their power system or disrupt the sewage system in China for two seconds, the whole world will hear the problem. Or if you disrupt water flow in India with a population of 1.4 billion, I cannot imagine the disaster or catastrophe that is going to happen. So that if one person is protected and the other is open, the a cyber hacker, ethically or unethical one, can use that same point to get to the other side because it's borderless. So the partners, the sponsors of this program, especially the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, perhaps need to speak to the government because the policy direction has to come from government and even if it is advisory, government of all nations listen to these two bodies. Then cyber, uh, 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 global cyber conference or cyber movement building capacity will not come in. Because if you want to build capacity, for what? But when they identify the problem, the capacity will work. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for that viewpoint. Um, I now, because we're aware of time, do we have any questions out there? Lady over there. Thank you very much. Uh, Leila Decker, I work for Jean. Uh, I have a question for you because we've, you've discussed the importance of the safe, well, securing the infrastructure. Throughout the week, we've discussed a lot the idea that the community needs to, to work together, knowledge should be exchanged. But I have a question for the emerging countries where even just a simple router is quite expensive. How do we ensure that they have the sufficient basic infrastructure to participate in this global effort? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anybody want to jump in there? That is a good question. Um, and uh, uh, it's a question that uh, is not easily solved uh, because indeed governments are making investments in the infrastructure of third states and you have uh, investment banks, you have all, all kinds of types of investments uh, and still we are at a point that that needs to be made sustainable. Uh, so here also the private sector comes in, uh, not only the big tech, but also local private sector, so to say, uh, and that is in some places also still in development. Uh, so this is a, a, a complex, uh, also chronologically a complex uh, issue to, to be solved. Yet at the same time, by investing uh, through aid, through global um, investment, such as in our end, for instance, the gateway, uh, uh, or through investment banks, the idea is that we use that investment not only to lay down the infrastructure, but also to create a sustainable environment where that infrastructure can continue to grow and where a country uh, is also at a simultaneously building its capacity and building its ecosystem uh, for that infrastructure to continue to be built. So it's a, it's a slow process. Uh, but it's something that needs to uh, continue to have our attention and uh, frankly it's a it's a debate that we've I've had uh, for a for many uh, hours actually already at that conference like how can we actually simulate that what kind of additional mechanisms do we have in place uh, in order to to ensure uh, we just had a panel about AI where we had a similar question so it's definitely also something that I will take home uh, to see uh, what more we can think of to uh, uh, to address this issue. Perfect. Do we have any more questions? We have not a lot of time, so don't have to be a quick one. And if I don't end on time, I'll get in trouble and they won't ever invite me back again. <laughs> yes, uh, hello, uh, Mark Urban, uh, a colleague of, well, uh, from Red Clara, from uh, Research and Education Network in Latin America. Precisely uh, on, on those points that were tackled uh, both by uh, the gentleman and uh, 
by uh, Manon and uh, also uh, Leila. Uh, how do we re reconcile the, this, these times and the complexity of the process that uh, we all understand that it, it is heavy in a uh, heavy workload as such, but with precisely the, the urgent needs that are there uh, pending uh, in, in the context, in the international context, in, and the pressure that is coming with this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, big uh, challenges, no? Uh, in, we, you, well, I, I don't have to, to make any, any picture, I, I guess, but you, 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 we all understand climate change, etc., uh, wars, etc. Uh, and with some stakeholders in, in, in the landscape that are acting maybe faster than others, and, but with some impeding, maybe, challenges connected to, to, these, uh, to these kind of actions, no? I'm not... Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um. It's, uh, I have a couple of thoughts, but I'm happy to <laughs> jump no, in. Uh, uh, maybe just to say that this is also a market issue. Yeah. Huh? I mean, this is not a, a government. Uh, I mean, depending on which country you live, I would say. But uh, in general, this is also uh, a, go a market issue. So uh, governments are involved, have a role to play. But this is not just uh, the government. This is a, a multi-stakeholder issue that we need to solve uh, in incorporation so unless you live in China and then it's a government issue. <laughs> the one thing I will say so at the Institute we're about to launch a future of access to compute index and part of that we've looked at 55 countries across 25 indicators and part of it there's a data explorer that will come out and what the aim of that is really to look at is when going to your question and sort of look about what is the investment that will deliver maximum like impact within what you're trying to build, power comes out as a big one at the baseline that some countries invest in a supercomputer because they want to be on a list of supercomputers but without the power infrastructure to do it. To so begin to think about how you sequence your, both your policy and your tangible investment into this process on a wider picture is uh, part of that. So um, that's um, where we're at. Um, but just to answer a bit of that question, to provide those structures that countries can visualize what their pathway is. So before we wrap up very, very, very quickly, we started the session thinking about what worries you now. On a super quick fire, what's worrying you for the future? on uh, thinking whether it's the subsea cables, whether it's the cloud, whether it's uh, the satellites, or whether it's at the intersection of the all three. Um, what do you think we'll be discussing in Switzerland in 2025? Okay, I'll, I'll start again. I always get to start for this. Okay. Um, I, I think that the two things that I'm not necessarily worried, but I will keep a close eye in terms of how it's going to evolve, is how this uh, relationship between states and non-state actors, commercial entities, etc., is going to is going to play out. I think everyone recognizes that these are not problems that states can solve alone. We need private sector. We need you know infrastructure managers and owners and developers. Um, but on one side, that recognition isn't necessarily matched with the processes that allow for a, a truly inclusive dialogue and debate. So I'm curious to see how that is going to progress. Um, exactly. Giacomo took the year of the luck to be first. <laughs> no. So indeed, I think the evolving threats and certainly also non-state actors and their role, uh, also how they are sometimes used by state actors, I think that is a headache that is uh, already keeping me awake but will continue to keep me awake. But I think also we will continue to discuss uh, the, the cooperation within the multi-stakeholder community, how to shape that and how to uh, actually take that forward to address some of the challenges. I mean, we spoke just about uh, the investment. I mean, investing in universities, academic community, investing in private sector, and like, how do we how do we do that in a meaningful way, uh, in a way that is also um, uh, susceptible or it's also uh, tailored to to those who are. Uh, requiring it, you know, on a needs base. So that is something that we will continue to discuss and that we need to develop solutions for that we might not have today. I think we 
for me, it's um, probably the fact that I think cybersecurity is a moving target. Um, and, and then the question is, you know, will we, ever, will we ever get there? I think one of the things that we have to worry about now is the fact that everything is digital, everything is digitalized, everything depends on connectivity, which means that there's more things to think about, more things to protect, more things to, to really think about in terms of um, their interconnectedness. When you look at where we are now in terms of the energy supply, as you mentioned, um, a, a big issue in terms of the ambitions as far as the transformation is concerned, but also a big issue in terms of as we start to um, build more power plants, generate more you know, electricity, again, that's critical infrastructure that has to be protected. So it just seems to me that the more we do, the more there is um, that needs to be done. This is hard going last because all the good points are taking. Um, I, I, I do want to flag sort of the role in AI in this conversation. We had an AI panel right before this panel, and um, I think it was flagged that Chad GPT just came out a year ago, and it sounds like it's always been here and it's moved at a very quick pace. And so in 2025, I do think we're going to be talking about some new developments around that quick pace. And my hope is that we will be discussing how AI is giving cyber defenders an asymmetric advantage into gathering better threat intelligence and information gathering and being able to you know, arm us better on the cybersecurity front and being able to track some of this nat nation state um, actors targeting critical infrastructure. And I think a lot of the things that we talked about today, including, you know, global cooperation, frameworks, collaboration, to some degree, they do feel like a moving target. I think we're still going to be discussing them there, but my hope is that we will not be discussing them from the starting place that we're, we're at now, that we're going to be discussing the developments towards, um, you know, leveraging technology for transforming the human condition and human potential. Thank you very much, and I guess the only advantage of expanding threat services is that we will be here in two years' time having this discussion and not out of a job, even with ChatGPT, um, hopefully using it to make us quicker and faster at what we're at. Um, I want to thank all my panelists for an extraordinary, insightful conversation. I have a million more questions, but uh, they will have to wait. Thank you for everyone who joined us and stuck through a million sessions. And um, have a great closing to the conference. And a thank you also to Elizabeth. We have to thank Elizabeth Eigner, who convened this panel, and Kamina Kavanaugh, who couldn't make it today. But uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you.